Today, the diesel engine has been greatly improved and it's now fitted in many cars. This contraption, which Rex and I built for a TV series a few years ago, is diesel powered. The engine from a Volkswagen Golf car hardly looks any different from a petrol one. However, as diesel originally thought, the higher compression does make the engine more efficient and do more miles to the gallon. Here, as well as driving the vehicle, the engine's also powering a hydraulic lift. The most dramatic change to both diesel and petrol engines in the last 10 years has been the addition of sophisticated electronics. This modern car engine, compared to the earlier ones, is horrendously complicated. For example, there's two computers on board. One controls the electronic fuel injection, another one controls the cruise control. Even though the engine is much more complicated, this makes the most of every drop of fuel and gives greater fuel economy and power. Although the complex electronics would be impossible to repair by the roadside, I've driven 80,000 miles in it, and even with my poor maintenance, it's never even failed once. The engine's improved enormously since 1900. It starts at a flick of a switch. It's incredibly powerful. And it's really very reliable. But it's still far from perfect. Despite its power, it's really very wasteful. Four-fifths of the energy released by the petrol is simply lost as heat through the radiator and the exhaust. And the exhaust gases themselves pose even worse problems. There's an awful lot of them. The average car releases four times its own weight in exhaust gases during its life. And it's all pretty horrid stuff. This wasn't such a problem when there weren't so many cars around. If we are to realise in full the motor car's vast potential for good, we must use it and care for it wisely. The motor car has been the key to open new horizons, not for the few, but for all. And all of us share in the responsibility of safeguarding the benefits it has brought. If we plan for the future, if we look ahead to clear all obstacles and roadblocks, if we recognize the importance of this great individual freedom of movement, the motor car will be the key to our ever-widening horizons of tomorrow. to sing about America, you'd better make sure you have the breath to sing with. We've been fighting air pollution, but it's time to fight harder. Help us. It's a beautiful country. Let's not get all choked up about it. In an attempt to clean up the exhaust gases, catalytic converters are gradually becoming compulsory all over the world. Recent reports from America suggest, in practice, catalysts may only remove about 30% of the poisonous gases because the engine needs careful maintenance for them to work properly. Oh, not to worry, Sir Troll, with the catalytic, oh, very common these days. I'll just yes. adjust this screw and then that'll be all right. Even when they do work perfectly, they only convert the gases to carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas. It's getting awfully hot, dear. Oh, boy, oh, Dad! Nothing for it. I'll have to go electric. It's the only way to be really green. Electric cars aren't perfect either. 
the electricity to charge their batteries just transfers a lot of the pollution to the power stations. I don't think there's any such thing as a completely green car. The engine's really a victim of its own success. Despite its disgusting exhaust, it's such a reliable and potent source of power, it's made the car and all sorts of other machines completely indispensable. It's so central to our modern way of life that there's almost something rather religious about it. <laughs> 